From Gimlet Media, I'm Alex Bloomberg, and this is Without Fail, the show where I talk with artists, athletes, entrepreneurs, visionaries of all kinds about their successes and their failures and what they've learned from both. So every day I walk to work and I walk down this busy street in Brooklyn, Flatbush Avenue, and I pass a ton of stores and shops and commercial outlets. There's cafes, clothing stores, shipping center, a super fancy sneaker shop. And you know, they're sometimes busy. There's the morning rush at the bagel shop. There's the line out the door of the sneaker store when they have a hot new shoe in stock. But other times you can go by these places and there's not much going on, customer two, but pretty slow. And that's most of retail, right? Busy times, slow times. But there's this one store on my walk that bucks the trend. It's always busy, it's packed with people pouring over the merchandise. And the store, it looks completely different too. It's brand new, it's all glass. There's these soaring floor to ceiling windows on all sides. And inside the decor is all sleek and minimalist. It looks more like a gallery or a cathedral than a store. If you haven't guessed, it's an Apple store. The award-winning, trend-defying, single-handed rebuke to the death of brick-and-mortar retail narrative brought about by Amazon, that store. And I mention all this because nowadays, we think of the Apple store as this institution that's always been here, you know, as signature a part of the Apple brand as the iPhone. But there was, of course, a time before the Apple store when it was just an idea in someone's mind. And not just any someone, a very particular someone, a someone who happens to be my guest on today's show. His name is Ron Johnson. And I want to talk to Ron because the story of how Ron Johnson built the Apple Store into the iconic institution it is today is a fascinating one. First, because of the way Ron Johnson came to Apple, it wasn't the usual route through computer engineering in Silicon Valley. He came by a very different path, but nevertheless ended up forming this deep and fascinating partnership with Steve Jobs, which he talks about in very candid detail in our interview. But I also want to talk to Ron because of what he did after his time at Apple. After his success with the Apple Store, he decided to try something new, something he was excited about, but everyone else thought he was a little crazy to want. He did it anyway, and it ended up being one of the defining failures of his life. We talk about all of this and more in our conversation, and we began at the beginning of his career, when he made a choice that would ultimately set him on the path to his greatest successes and his greatest failures. He was graduating from Harvard Business School, and as one of the top students in his program, he had his pick of the most coveted jobs. And there was one job in particular that everyone in his class wanted. Well, almost everyone. When I was at Harvard Business School, I graduated in 1984. The dream job was to go to Wall Street or go work in consulting. And like I had uh, the good fortune of getting an offer from Goldman Sachs M&A Group, which was one of those highly coveted HBS jobs. But I had this itch to become a retailer, and so that's what I did. So you got this offer from Goldman. You turned down uh, Goldman, a bunch of other investment banks. Who did you finally say yes to? Well, I ended up going to work for a little company that's now not existing called Mervyn's uh, that's based in, was based in Hayward, California. I don't think there was a single person but my dad <laughs> who thought I made a great career decision out of HBS. And people ask me all the time, why did you do that? Well, what we forget is just as working in technology today is a pretty coveted place for a young graduate, you know, to be a computer scientist, a data scientist, go work one of these hot tech companies, that was really what retail was in 1984. Retailing was the innovative space in the economy. And this was true, even if Ron's classmates didn't find this innovation super sexy. There was a lot happening in retail. This is when specialty retailers like The Gap were just coming on the scene, redefining retail forever away from the department store. Ron saw it all as an exciting time to be in retail. And he was right. Ron did his stint at Mervyn's and then got hired away to Target, where he ended up participating in one of the most successful rebrands in retail history. Ron started Target's first design partnership, bringing in the well-known designer Michael Graves to create products for Target. And Target went from being a forgettable retailer to a cool, inexpensive place to shop. It went from Target to Target. And Ron was one of the handful of people at the company that helped usher in that transformation. And it was around this time, in 1999, that he got a phone call. The person on the phone said he was calling on behalf of Steve Jobs. He said, you know, Apple wants to open retail stores. Would you like to lead the effort for them? 
And if so, Steve would like to meet you and learn more about you and what you might do. What? I, I, I mean, you got to put it in context. Apple was not a great company at the time. Right. Apple was a cult brand with a very low market share that had a very rabid, beloved customer base that wanted to grow. Right. And I remember at the time, though, telling, you know, my wife and friends I was going to go out and talk to Steve on Apple stores. People thought I was crazy. Why? Well, if you approach 2000, it was all about the internet. Right. It was Webvan. Webvan was exploding. The dot-com bubble was happening. Why would Ron go to a struggling niche computer maker to work with a guy who had a legend of being pretty tough to work for when there were all these other great companies in the Valley that were getting all the high stock prices and all the high multiples? Uh Uh-huh. What drew you to it? But I decided I was attracted not to working for Steve or working at Apple. I was attracted to taking what we did at Target with design and getting a chance to apply that to a company like Apple. Mm -hmm. I would get to figure out where to put stores. I would get to figure out how to design a store. I would have to design a new experience for a brand that's never had a customer experience other than what they marketed. But I thought it was a fertile field to do something great. And that's what attracted me to it. So tell me about the first meeting with with Steve Jobs. Uh, He showed up an hour late, you know, and I was sitting in a little couch next to his conference room next to his office. And I was reading all of a sudden this. I saw these two knees go by with torn jeans. We sat down for two hours and we just connected. I mean, that conversation went by like it was 10 minutes. Do you remember what, uh, what you talked about? We, well, we, we started out, we just talked about me, retail, Target, and it then evolved into Apple in stores. And then I remember he said, well, if I could write a billion dollar check today and have a hundred great stores, I would write that in a nanosecond. Why did Steve Jobs think that they should be opening stores? Because that's also sort of an unconventional thing. What was his thinking? Well, Steve's, I'd say probably without a doubt, the smartest, but the most intuitive person I know. Steve cared about his customers. He wanted to serve them in new and interesting ways, but he knew to compete. He had to compete not just on the product side, but on the customer service side. And he said, you know, Ron, I've got $4 billion in the bank. We've got a lot of cash. But what I don't have, I don't have a way to talk to the customer directly. And we took a walk down to what I later learned was the boardroom at Apple. And in there, they had the whole product lineup. Mm -hmm. And it was four computers. It was two portables and two desktops. And I said, so this is what we have to sell. (laughs) And And he said, yes. And I remember saying to him, well, you know, most retail stores, the size is determined by the product line. We can fit our whole product line on a conference room table. How big a store do you think we should build? And he said, I don't know. And I said, well, my instinct has got to be big enough to be relevant. I said, would you be willing to build a 6,000-square-foot store? He said, yes. And I said, well, that's an interesting dilemma because we got to figure out what to fill all that space with. He said, well, why don't you do this? It was, it was the week before Thanksgiving, if I recall. Mm-hmm. He said, why don't you take some time? Do you have time Thanksgiving weekend? Just write a little note to me about what you do if you open the store. It's how you'd approach the problem. I said, sure, I can do that. And I went home and jotted down my notes and wrote a little thing and sent it to him. And I never heard from him until he sent me a note and said, hey, I'd like you to come back. So I came back, sat down with Steve, and I said, so what would you think of my ideas? He goes, oh, I didn't think they were very good, but I really like you, and I'd like to offer you the job. And, you know, at that moment, Steve offered me the job to come run the retail stores. And uh, so it was really two hours with him, a little bit of time with his leadership team, and and we decided it was the right thing to do. And a couple of uh, not very good ideas, apparently. That's what he said at the time. <laughs> um, so you sign up. You like how long? How long from the time you took the job to the first store opened? So I started February of two thousand. Our first store opened in May. 2001. Now, I twiddled, I twiddled my thumbs for the first month. My only meeting a week was the executive team meeting. Uh-huh. Uh, but I had to kind of imagine what a store would be. There was a lot of work to do. Yeah. And it was interesting, though, as we 
you know, Steve had the idea, you know, you ought to rent a warehouse and build out a prototype. And that was really a thing a retailer wouldn't do, but obviously a company like Apple would do. They always build prototypes of products. Right. And why not build a prototype of a store? And so about two to three miles from campus, uh, we built out a place. What was the space that you rented out? Uh, it was just a warehouse, you know, your typical warehouse space in the valley. Uh-huh. But it was so much fun. We had a 6,000-square-foot space, and every week we try something new. You've been in retail now your whole life, and you have never gone mm-hmm. through a process like this designing a store. I never picked a piece of real estate or designed a store in my life. I uh-huh. never designed a house. Right. <laughs> I, I, I liked architecture. I would never had to do it. Wait, so take me through that process more. Like, so, so, because this is very fascinating. Every Tuesday at nine in the morning for about three hours, we'd meet, I'd lead the meeting, Steve would give his input. Mm-hmm. And then the next week we'd change it all and try again. If I didn't have Steve, I don't know if we would have got it done. I mean, Steve is so good at this. What was, what made him... Good. You know, it was amazing. Steve would come over at 9 o'clock, probably get there 15 minutes late, 9.15 every Tuesday. And we'd have worked for a week on the store design. And they were radically different. Mm -hmm. And here were Lily Parker's car, walk in the front door, stop, look at 6,000 square feet, you know, with kind of his hand on his chin. And he'd say, here's what I like and here's what I don't. You know, he could pick up all of the changes on the spot. Really? So if we, if the week before we had talked about, you know, our tables are 30 inches, inches high, we should drop them to 34 because it'll be better to rest your hand for the computer. Steve would come in and say, I like the new table height. And you hadn't told him? He, no, he knew we were going to work on it, but he could tell. And he'd remember everything we had talked about changing from the week before. Uh-huh. If he showed him a graphic image, a, a window display, Steve would come in and say, well, I like this better last week. I like this now. His ability to incisively critique a creative endeavor was second to none. Huh. And his intuition, his understanding of what customers would respond to was unparalleled. And it was a gift for me to work with him. Uh, Because you're always in business when you're inventing things. You've got to balance the dream with the data. Most people, the data overtakes the Mm decision-making, and then you don't have a dream. Steve always stayed focused on the prize, you know, and he could articulate it so clearly. Like, he used to love to do things in three or four words. Like, we all remember the iPod. How do you describe the iPod? A thousand songs in your pocket. Right. What was the iPhone? We're going to reinvent the phone. Right. You know, Steve had an ability to stay focused on the prize better than anybody I know, and he wouldn't bring a product out or open a store until he believed it was as perfect as he could imagine it. Yeah. Well, and you know, he's famous for, like, not minting words and can be, you know, critical or scary. Or did, did you ever get any of that? You know, Steve was, uh, I don't know, he was always pretty great to me, Uh you know. Um, Very kind, very supportive. Uh, And Steve, I think, and I got along really quite well. I was never as close to Steve as some of the other members that E2 had worked with him before. Mm -hmm. Um, We didn't do a ton personally outside of work. Mm -hmm. We talked on the phone every night, you know, 8 o'clock sharp. I knew the phone rang. It was Steve. Um, He would call you every night. Yeah, the first year, every night. Wow. But that was Steve because he intentionally used to say, I think my management style is like a butterfly. I want to be able to float in where things are new or things need help. But other than that, I want to delegate and let people go. Uh-huh. The only way I can delegate to you, Ron, with confidence is if you can know exactly how I would think about an issue that you're trying to figure out on your own. Mm -hmm. And the only way you can know how I think is if we're really close. So what time do your kids go to bed? And I said, they go to bed at 8 o'clock. He goes, if you don't mind, I'll call you after the kids go to bed, and we'll catch up every day. And literally for my first year at Apple, I think the phone will ring at 8 o'clock. Ron, Steve, and I'd say, hi. And there'd be a long pause, and I'd say, well, how was your day? Mm -hmm. And he talked to me about Apple. He talked to me about personal things. We talk about the stores, 
but he wanted me to understand how he thought. Those phone calls that happened every every night, like how how long did they go? Oh, I'd say a half hour. I mean, honestly, I felt like I felt like when you were in eighth grade, did you ever have a girlfriend? Uh, sadly, no, but, but I wanted one. <laughs> I think I did too. But remember back then, you know, you'd have to pick up the phone Yeah. and you know, the way phones work back then, if you had four phones in the house, you know, your brother might get on the other line, try to listen in, or your yeah. parents might get on and you used to go hide somewhere and you'd call this girl and you're nervous as heck, but then you'd have a conversation and you talk about a lot of irrelevant stuff because you're just trying to build a relationship. Uh-huh. I kind of felt when I, you know, started to work for Steve, I had an eighth grade girlfriend finally. You were on the phone with your crush. I was on the phone with my crush. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Um, okay. So, so you, you're, you're prototyping the store. You're having these conversations mm-hmm. with Steve Jobs. Was there anything that you sort of went down and then ultimately totally scrapped? Yeah, so we had a major fork in the road, which became just, it was such a great glimpse into Steve. Uh So uh, Steve and I, we had made the decision early on to design the store, not about products, but of what you do. And I remember saying to Steve one night on one of those eight o'clock calls, I said, I've been thinking about, you know, the Mac's kind of the center of your digital universe. Think about the Mac at the center, and you get all these devices. Mm -hmm. And he said, could you write that down and send me a note? I said, sure. And I remember going to uh, Monday's meet at ET, and he goes, guys, I've got a vision. The Mac is the digital hub. And that was in uh, September of 2000. And in I think it was January 2001 when Steve announced the vision for Apple that the Mac would become the digital hub. Uh-huh. Well, the next morning uh, on Tuesday when I went to work, and Steve would like me to meet in his office. We'd drive over together in his car. Uh-huh. And I showed up in his office and I said, Steve, I've been thinking about the stores. I think we've got it all wrong. You know, we've organized the store around products. I think you should relay out the store. <sighs> and he looked at me and he got really, he didn't get upset. He got really upset. And he said, Ron, he goes, do you know how hard I've worked on this store? He goes, I've been coming over here for nearly a half a year every Tuesday. And we finally got something we want to build and you want to tear it up. I don't know that I have the energy to do this. Uh, he goes, I don't want you to bring it up today. I said, okay. <laughs> so we get in his car and we drive this two to three mile, probably takes 10, 15 minutes over to the warehouse. Didn't say a word. I didn't say a word. I didn't think he was very happy. What are you thinking while you're driving over in silence? I just figure I'm not going to push it on him here. Uh, I've made my point. He made his point. Let's go. I was more curious how the day would start. <laughs> So we, we park our car, we walk in. At that time, we probably had 30 to 40 people in there waiting for Steve to come. Steve walks in, he looks around, as he always did when he walked in, he said, well, guys, Ron thinks this store is all wrong. <laughs> and he's right. So I'm going to leave now, and I'll come back when you've redesigned the store. And that was it. He left. Wow. He called me that night at 8 o'clock, and he said, Ron, he goes, you reminded me of a really important lesson. Everything great I've done, I've had to have the courage at some point in the process to start over and rethink it. And he told me stories about every Pixar movie he'd done, how they're pretty close to want to release the movie, and they realize, you know, we could change the ending. We could improve a character. He went through some of the products he'd done at Apple and how you had to know when it was good enough. And he said, I'm really proud of you for challenging the design of the store. And he goes, I'm going to have to have you lead it a little more because I don't know that I have the energy to start from scratch, but we ought to do it better. And I thought that was just a great example of Steve's leadership. You know, he it's pretty quick to go from don't talk about it right. to a three-mile car ride to say, we're going to change this thing. Um, but that was Steve. And because of that, we built a better store. So you guys go through this whole thing. You redesign it in the middle. When it first opened, like the night before the first store opened to the public, what are you thinking? What are yep. you feeling? Oh, I you, like it. You have no clue if it's any good. Yeah. Until it's all done, you can't even evaluate it. You know, we had uh, barricades up, so you couldn't even look in from the mall or the street to see what it looked like, right? right? Everyone's got ladders. You don't know. And then the big question is, will people come? It was the night before the first opening, we opened two stores. I told Steve, 
you know, let's not advertise. Our advertising is our real estate. We'll send out an email to Apple people within 100 miles to tell them we're opening our first store, and we'll see if they come. And he said, fine. And I remember getting a call from uh, one of my partners on the East Coast, and she called to say, Ron, I don't think it's going to work very well. It's 45 minutes before it opens, and we have 30 people in line. I go, maybe we should advertise. I started thinking, what am I going to tell Steve? That's bad or good? Bad. No one was there. You were expecting more people than 30 people in line. Oh, what? we well, Apple gets pretty good people at its keynote. Yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, we threw a party and didn't invite anybody. <laughs> uh, but then all of a sudden she gives me a call. She goes, Ron, they're starting to come. And when they opened that store, there were 1,500 people in line. Wow. So interestingly, all the Apple people wanted to be there for the opening, but like me, they didn't know how many people would be there, so they just showed up at 10 o'clock when it was going to open. Uh-huh. And we had lines out that store all day. So I was down, you know, in Glendale for the Glendale opening, and the same thing. You know, now I feel a little better because nobody came there at the start. We had maybe 50 people at about 9.15. By the time the store opened, they were snaked through the line by the Nordstrom Stars out into the parking lot where we had to hustle and get water. It was a hot day. You know, this is May in California. It was a warm spring day. And we had people, thousands of people in line. On behalf of everyone at Apple, this store has been created for you, our great customers. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to Apple. We had 10,000 people, I think it was, visit each of those stores opening day, which is unheard of. What was that like for you? It was, it was just really gratifying. I stayed, I was in the Glendale store from eight in the morning that day till the last customer left eight at night. And I spent the whole day there. It was just such a, a gratifying thing after you've worked so hard at something to get to experience it. So after, after that, after the first initial, was there just a feeling of like, wow, this is a hit and we just got to step no, on the gas? No, it was awful. No. Uh, remember, we opened in May. Uh, September 11th, 2001 happened three months later. Nobody wanted to go to malls. People were scared to go to malls. Uh, uh, Apple was not having a particularly great year. Um, we didn't have really products for many people because most people wouldn't switch from a PC to a Mac. So the early adopters who loved Apple came to the store in May, June, or July, but they wouldn't come back till we announced a new product. Uh, people just walked by the store in the mall and didn't stop in. It strikes me that like the, the the problem that you identified that very first day when you met Steve Jobs and he was showing you mm-hmm. here's our product lineup that was the problem <laughs> up until that was the problem yeah <laughs> you didn't have enough to sell we didn't have enough to sell and so we actually made the store smaller by 2003 because we were worried about how do we make money things might have gone on this way with people walking by the store admiring it through the windows but not actually going inside and buying anything if not for something huge happening. What that was, coming up after these words from our sponsors. Welcome back to Without Fail and my conversation with Ron Johnson. Before the break, I had teased you with a big new thing that was going to rescue the Apple Store. What that thing was, the thing that took the Apple Store from being a cool novelty to a retail juggernaut, was this. This is an Apple ad from 2004. If you were around and happened to glance at a TV that year, you probably saw them. It's these dancing silhouettes rocking out to music that they're listening to on their iPods. They're super cool and stylish, and they feature this brand new Apple technology, this perfect tool for taking advantage of this new thing, the MP3. And as the ad concludes, words appear on the screen. For Mac or PC. In other words, you no longer needed a Macintosh computer to use Apple products. They were now for everyone. That was big. The iPod went to Windows, and the stores became famous. Right. It was when we finally had a product that would appeal to everybody that the real genius of the Apple Store design came to fruition. The other thing, you know, the Apple Stores did really well during my time, and they continue to flourish, but you can't separate what the store was from Apple's incredible innovation in the hardware and software. Right. You know, the stores became the new face of Apple, and they've been a wonderful thing. But I think the real strength of Apple was that constant flow of life-changing, life-breathing products 
that really became the engine to want to visit an Apple store to learn about these things. Mm -hmm. You know, when we launched the iPhone, everyone wanted to touch that phone yeah. to see what a new interface without a dial would be. You know, the stores became a beautiful stage for people to experience what people in Cupertino created. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, without Cupertino's great work, the stores wouldn't have been great. Right. But I do believe without the stores, Apple wouldn't be great. If, if it hadn't been for the stores, what, what do you think would have been the problem with Apple? Nobody would know about it. Apple wasn't even sold in Best Buy until 2004. Right. The leading consumer electronics retailer in the world didn't carry Apple products. When I joined Apple, you could buy them at Sears. Not exactly a household name anymore. Yeah. And your local Apple specialist. Right. And, and CompUSA. But there wasn't really a lot of distribution. You know, it's really hard to build a hardware business when the channel is so concentrated. After 12 years, Ron had turned an experiment with retail into a resounding success. He'd helped Apple open roughly 350 stores and expand into 13 countries. And he could have kept at it, opening stores, tweaking them a little, collecting a paycheck. But he was starting to feel the itch, the itch for something new. And I think at, at one point I decided, am I going to stay with Apple, which had become, quite frankly, a hobby. We had gotten pretty good at identifying sites. We had gotten pretty good at building stores. It wasn't really the challenge it was when we had launched. Right. And being someone that likes to be an underdog likes a big challenge. Boy, what could be more exciting than trying to reinvent a department store? Uh -huh. uh, so when J.C. Penney's called, they first called me about a board seat. But then that quickly became, after a bunch of interviews, would you like to become the CEO? I, I imagine you have to tell Steve. Was, was he like, wait, you, you want to leave Apple and go to work at J.C. Pen, Penney? Yeah, no, his, his reaction was more, Ron, if you want to run a company, uh, there are a lot of companies you could run. He goes, I have a lot of people I know in the world. I have a lot of people here in the Valley. There are a lot of great companies. I don't know why you'd go to a B or C retailer when you could go to a really good company. You know, right. that was his advice. Right. And he went through and looked at the board. You know, he wasn't super impressed by the whole squad. Yeah. And he just did not understand why I wanted to do it. But I just told him, you know, I have a little fondness in my heart for uh, the department store. Where does that love come from? Well, it's, it comes from, I think, a love of people. So when I came out of undergrad at Stanford, uh -huh. I went to work in one of these big, big eight accounting firms. And our office was in downtown Minneapolis. Now, you'd park about two blocks away. But because it was so cold, you didn't have to walk outside. The department store, Dayton's, mm -hmm. would open up its main floor of the store. I could walk through the store to get to work every day. And every morning I'd walk through that store, and I remember the greeter, Jim, we used to chat every morning, and I'd ask him, what's new in the store? And as I'd walk down that department store, I'd see all these new products all the time. And then I found I'd go to a mall, and I had incredible energy being around all the creativity and all the people and all the service and young families and old and kids. And I just loved being in the physical store. And I realized at its heart that I love and get energy from people. Mm -hmm. And what a great retailer does is they make connections all day long with people. And then you ended up um, taking the job. Well, when I finally accepted the job, Steve said, I have one request. He goes, I'd like you to stay at Apple. He was really in poor health at the time mm -hmm. for another six months. Uh -huh. And it turned out I joined JCPenney the same month that, you know, Steve passed away. Uh -huh. You know, so I was able to spend his last time with him, um, which was great. Uh, mm -hmm. But I had this window when I had to kind of get to know the team. Everyone knew I was coming. What kind of shape was JCPenney in at, at that time when you, just, when you became CEO? Well, they were actually pretty pretty solid. They were growing about the same rate as Macy's. Mm -hmm. They were not losing share, but the department stores were losing share, right? right? Department stores around this time were struggling to keep up with new shopping habits. Everything, of course, was going online. Amazon was taking over. And JCPenney's loyal customer base was aging. Ron knew he was going to have to make big changes in the company. And I was pretty worried about going into a 
long-established company and trying to ex exercise a major transformation with a company that might not quite have the stomach for it. Right. And so I had this nervousness inside. I almost didn't go. I remember going to the board in October saying, I'm not sure this is the right thing. I actually gave a presentation to the board and I said, you know, this is what I'm going to do. What was in that presentation? The, the fundamental thing was we had to change everything, right? The big issue with a lot of retailers, your customers get older. And if you're going to succeed in any business, you got to have a young customer. So I wanted to find a way to win the hearts and minds of the young family while serving the current customer better. Right. Right. Well, the problem was that they had this pricing strategy where the average item in the store was sold at 60% off. Well, if you got to take 60% off to sell it, the product doesn't have much value on its own. Uh, or you wouldn't do that, right? Right. So I made the decision that the way the world was going was to everyday low price. Uh -huh. That's where Walmart had succeeded. That's what the Gap had done in the heyday. You know, let's just make every day a great day to shop. Don't wait for a sale. Don't collect the coupons. Every day is a great day to shop. Now, when we did that, I remember telling the board, we're going to go through the toughest year of our lives because we are not going to promote for an entire year. So we will run decreases because last year we got people in the store through promotion. Right. We've got to cleanse ourselves and get to a base business. But when we're done, whatever that new base is, we will start to grow because right. we'll start to attract a new customer. If you don't want, I don't have to come. But they said, no, we want to do that. You know? <laughs> and so I, I started in November and we moved very fast. Okay, so, so what'd you do? What happened? Well, we went into that thinking our sales would drop 15%, and I think they dropped 19. Right. Well, to me, that's pretty close. Right. You know, let's <laughs> tweak and adapt. But to the board, like all their friends on Wall Street, what are you letting this guy do? Uh, Penny yeah. spent, you know, 100 years building out a business, and you're losing 20% overnight? You guys are crazy. And yeah. so it became a very difficult uh, press environment. For everybody. It's it's funny, like around this time, I was running a, a, a show on NPR called Planet Money. And one of our reporters, Zoe Chase, who, a fantastic reporter, she did a story about the transformation at JCPenney that I want to play you just a clip of. Uh, she found this, this woman who was a JCPenney shopper who I think is probably emblematic of at least some of the other people who were there. Let, let me just play you this clip. Sure. When it first happened, I was traumatized and I come home and I cry over it. My husband's like, what's wrong? I said, pennies don't have no sales no more. I need my store back. Carol Vickery had a ritual of shopping at her JCPenney in Tallahassee, Florida, a ritual that included something that Ron Johnson had just taken away, bargain hunting. And there were a lot of Carol Vickery's. On Saturdays, you would go in at 9 and shop until 1, and then you get coupons, you got 50% off, $10, and the store would be so packed. You would always be bumping into people, getting through your stuff. It was crazy. It was great, though. They were like, they just wanted the coupons back. Right. Well, but that's, that's true. So if you think about it, 19% of the customers missed their coupon. Yeah. 81%, four out of five, went to pennies. And to me, I was more concerned about the 80% who stayed and treating them well than the 20% who only valued the company for a discount. Right. Now, that's a business choice, but that's what I believed. And I'd rather have an 80% of the customers happy and build on that base and attract new people, then spend your time not changing. When when did you realize in your tenure there, like, oh, this is maybe not going to work out? I think probably three to six months into the transformation, you just feel the support for the strategy waning as time went on. Yeah. It's so interesting, though. There always comes a time when when you're like, okay, we, we, we did this thing because we thought X and Y, and we're in the middle of it, and X and Y are maybe not happening, <laughs> but maybe they will. The biggest mistake people made is they don't have the courage to withstand the abyss. But when you go through life, no matter what you're trying to do, if you're changing a personal habit, it's really hard. You know, you want to get in shape. You want to exercise. You start running. It's really hard. But if you stick with it, pretty soon you'll love running. Mm -hmm. Same with companies. When you have a problem, you're losing share, your customer's aging, you got to change. And you want to pick the right change. But the most important thing, you better stick it out because there is a garden on the other side. 
but you got to see it through. And you got to do a lot of watering, a lot of pruning, a lot of investing, a lot of planting, and eventually you'll succeed. But mm. the most important thing is don't undertake a transformation without a commitment to seeing it through. The, the data that you were looking at is sort of like, yes, our, our, you know, like our, our customers have dropped by 20%, 18%, but the customers that are sticking around, that, that 80% that are sticking around, they like they the store it. better. They absolutely, and, and the employees. All right. the employees loved it because they didn't have to deal with all these coupons and all these people having an expired coupon. Uh, but I, I think a lot of people really liked where we were headed and wanted us to succeed. But the noise in the press, the noise, well, the volume was just too high. This is a crisis. J.C. Penney has uh, basically nosedived into the ground in a very short period of time. So J.C. Penney could fail uh, very, very quickly. If, when you start arguing with your customers about what they want, uh, it's not a good idea. And, and uh, they've got a very, very tough game to play from this point forward. Idiots. I mean, they took a perfectly profitable monster cash flow company and put it directly into the toilet with some giant experiment. You don't bet the did, did you ever have those, own, have your own dark nights of the soul where you're like, man, maybe this isn't right. Maybe I was wrong. Oh, all, all, you know, all the time. And I knew I had made mistakes with pennies, but they weren't fatal. I could have done things differently. But uh, at some point, Arrogance is not be willing to listen to other people. And I kind of got to a point where I said, you know, there are a lot of people who feel differently about this strategy. Yeah. And that's when I volunteered multiple times to step aside. And eventually the board called said, Ron, we're gonna go a different direction. I said, you know, good luck, you know? I will gladly step aside. But anyway, that's enough on pennies. It's the most I've ever talked about it. <laughs> okay. So, okay, how do you pick back up from that, and, and, and what did you decide to, to do next? Well, I, I, I didn't have to work again, but yeah. I started to, I decided, you know, when, as bad as Penny's was, I knew that my whole life had been a blessing. You know, mm -hmm. you get to work with Steve, to go to Apple at the right time, to be a target at the right time. I'd been more lucky than not. I realized in my bones, what I love doing is creating new things. I really love the idea of transformation. And wouldn't it be great to try that again? And I realized that in my career out of 38 years, I'd probably had eight great years. But that's what you work for, you know? <laughs> because most of the time you're building, you're trying to create something new. Uh, the economy's going bad. It's rare when you're doing something that everybody in the world says, boy, those guys are nailing it. You know, we had a few years at Apple that said, those are the best retail stores in the world. We had a few years at Target where Target is the hottest retailer on the planet right? That's what I want to get to at JCPenney. We didn't get there. But I wanted the chance to do that again because I had an idea that I thought and I now think is even much, much bigger than I've done before. Right. And once I got that idea into my head, I had to do it. What that idea was after the break. This episode of Without Fail is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one solution for anyone looking to make a beautiful website. And here to talk to me about beautiful websites is my producer, Sarah Platt. Hey. Is this your first time in a Squarespace ad? It is, yeah. All right. Thank you. <laughs> so I have this idea for a website. What is it? You know how you go to karaoke and sometimes you don't know what to sing? Sourced. It's a karaoke song generator website. Brilliant. So you can just pull it up on your phone or whatever, because Squarespace works on your phone. It's mobile. Yeah, it's mobile. <laughs> nice work. Thanks. You're really good at this. <laughs> yeah. You pull it up. And then you're at karaoke with your friends, and then you can just, like, search for the one you want. That's genius. Yeah. What would the dot-com equivalent be? Should be karaoke sing or song? Song. Karaoke song dot dance. I love it. If you have a great idea for a website, you can sign up for your free trial at squarespace.com slash WF. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code WF to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Welcome back to Without Fail and my conversation with Ron Johnson. So the idea that Ron Johnson had was a new company. And in a certain way, it was a combination of everything that had come before in his career. It was a combination of technology on the one hand and retail on the other hand. He wanted to invent the mobile retail store. And so in 2015, he started a company called Enjoy to do just that. Say you're purchasing a new phone online from, say, AT&T. On the AT&T website, there's a button that says, do you want somebody to come and help you set it up? 
That somebody is Ron's company, Enjoy. They partner with online retailers to help deliver their goods to the customer and help the customer get them set up. Companies like AT&T, Sonos, a bunch of companies like that that are selling things that have some sort of complicated setup to them that you might want somebody to help you set up. It's working pretty well. He already has over 1,000 employees. He's operating in nearly 40 cities, including in the United Kingdom. And Ron is super excited about everything that he's built. But in our conversation, he told me the thing that he's most proud of is the culture he's been able to create at his company. We built a culture here out of kindness, right? It's something I believe. I believe we choose to be kind every moment of the day. It's the most important decision we make as an individual, right? We built a whole company of kind people. We hire kind people, you know? That's something I can do. That's not that common. How did you decide to make kindness part part of your culture? Because I think it's why we're here on the planet, right? We're here to make life better, not for ourselves, but our neighbors, the people we come across. In a retail environment, it's your customers. It's your employees, right? And Uh so I just felt if we built a business out of kindness, you know, we would create something that has no limit to how successful it would be. You know, and if we're trying to go through people's doors and be invited into their living rooms and their kitchens and their dining rooms, and we're now in their home, if we can't establish a human connection based on a time-honored value like kindness, we won't ever get a chance to succeed. I'm curious about this just because, like, culture is something that we think about a lot as well. And we're only, we're, you know, a little over 100 people. In the very early days for us, it was just like, you know, there's 20 of us or 10 or 15 of us, and you're sort of like a band. You don't need to think about culture. It's just sort of like what the way you behave in the room. But but as we've gotten bigger, we've had to sort of make it more intentional. And sort of like kindness, I think, is something that I am very drawn to, but I wouldn't, I don't know if I would have had the guts to sort of put it in part as part of our mission. It is, it is our number one value. You know, I, i I tell the story to the team all the time. When my son, Will was in about sixth grade, he and I would have breakfast every day at a local coffee shop in Menlo Park called Ann's. And every parent knew if they wanted, they could drop off their boys and they could have free breakfast and Ron would drive the kids to school. One day, two boys there, Andrew and Will, and we were chatting before school, and I said, I got a question for you kids. You know, who's the best athlete in the class? You know the kids love to talk about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Will, Will looks at his buddy and says, well, that'd be Dash. And Dash goes, yeah, I'm a pretty good athlete. And then I said, well, who's the smartest kid in the class? And Dash looked over and said, I think that might be Will, your son. And then I said, who's the nicest person in the class? And they thought about that for a bit. And they gave me the name of a a boy. And I said, you know what's interesting? Wouldn't it be amazing if the best athlete were the nicest kid? What if the smartest person in the room was the kindest? You know, the only one who's making a choice here is the one that chooses kindness. If you're smart, that's a gift. If you're a great athlete, that's a gift. Kindness is a choice. And I believe that for my entire life. I was brought up in my Minnesota upbringing. And I believe that's true with companies. When you go to the Apple store and you see a genius helping somebody, that's an act of kindness. That's making love visual in the world. You know, when we go through the door and help someone, we get up and running with their new product for free, and everyone's laughing and having fun, and the kids are involved and the family's around, that's making love visual. This is like a time-honored gift that we try to provide to people. And we think kindness is what the world needs more of, and it's really uh, a pleasure to build a company on a value that everyone will embrace. It's just not chosen enough. I'm very stirred by that. I I find it really moving. It is something that, like, I wish more people would choose. Um, I am also, like, curious, like— how do you actually, though, sort of like put that into practice? Like, do you do you recruit for kind? How do you do that on a practical yeah, here's what basis? You do. Yeah. On a practical basis, you choose people who are kind. Uh-huh. And that's very easy to find. Most people are. And then you train people on technology. We can all learn technology, right? Mm-hmm. You hire people for different skills. But at the end of the day, you want people who love helping others. 
And you meet people, you can tell people who are kind of self-oriented and people who are other-oriented, right? Right. You make those choices. And so I think you can build a company. I think most great companies are built on timeless values because then they will be universally embraced. So that wraps up my conversation with Ron Johnson. Next time on Without Fail, I talk with Katerina Fake, co-founder of Flickr, who says when Yahoo wanted to buy her company, she didn't want to sell. We did a phone call, and I, I remember saying, I was like, you know, Shutterfly is preparing to go public. And I said, I, I don't see why we couldn't be on that same path. And I remember they laughed. The investors laughed. They're like, no, this Flickr thing will never be like that. That's next time on Without Fail. Without Fail is hosted by me and produced by Sarah Platt. It's edited by me, Nasneen Rasanjani, and Devin Taylor. Jarrett Floyd and Peter Leonard mix the episode. Music, our amazing theme music, by the equally amazing Bobby Lord. If you like Without Fail, leave us a review. It really does help. Also, you know what else you could do? Tell your friends about it. You like it, maybe they would too. Thanks for listening. Recently at The Nod, we've invented a new game. Six Degrees of Black Separation. All right, Tiana Taylor Uh is signed to Good Music, which is owned by Kanye West. Right. Kanye West has a song with Brandy Norfolk. That's true. Brandy is Whitney Houston's goddaughter, and she'll never let us forget it. (laughs) Think you can do it in fewer steps? Join us for a game of Six Degrees of Black Separation, now playing on The Nod. Thanks again to our sponsor, Squarespace. To build your next website in minutes, go to squarespace.com slash WF for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code WF to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain. 